She has her hand in every single aspect of the design, the look, the feel, the sound, the actors. She, she's really meticulous about who she chooses and why. She's a, she's a treasure, man. There's very few filmmakers like her. Very few. In the piano, the heroine is dragged to the bottom of the ocean by the instrument that represents her freedom. Ironic and surreal, the image speaks to the paradoxes faced by so many women in Jane Campion's films. What dream did that come out of? To use that kind of wild, unconscious imagery. Like, come on, only Jane Campion. As beautiful as they are uncompromising, Jane Campion's films challenge convention with complex stories of love, power, art, and the volatile relationships between women and men. She was somebody to always look at and feel, she's fearless, I can be fearless. She takes no shit, I can take no shit. Yeah, she takes no prisoners, Jane. <laughs> Jane is, I'd say, it's sort of like a white witch. She tunes into energies. She's very sensitive that way. And that's one way that we kind of communicate. When she's directing you, honesty is really an important thing for her. Anything else is a sort of waste of time. She has a gift of finding the strange in, in normalcy. Creating characters you would see in your everyday life, but bringing out the weird. Born and raised in New Zealand, Jane Campion studied anthropology and visual art before attending Australia's National Film School. I felt like a sort of, um, you know, guerrilla filmmaker. I've never known how to behave myself in the way that, you know, people are trained to, and, you know, it's not something that bothers me. Campion's debut feature, Sweetie, introduced a theme of mental instability into a tale about the love-hate relationship between sisters. Left behind. Pull yourself together. We can't take you anywhere. The growls by Genevieve Lemon as Sweetie reveal her animalistic nature as well as the director's treatment of mental illness with sympathy and wit. Sweetie, what a f up. <laughs> you know, that's Jane's life, I think, <laughs> you know? She's honest about herself and it's not all good, you know? She's happy to look at the uglier bits of life as she is the beautiful things. With her next project, Jane Campion explored the real life of award-winning New Zealand author Janet Frame, who spent six years in an asylum wrongly diagnosed with schizophrenia. Jane's interested in finding the poetic in the everyday, and that's what Janet Frame is sort of a master at, really. She picks very different worlds every time. But the themes are these women who are trapped by their lives and by their choices and by their mistakes and by who they are. And that's a very difficult thing to do. It's very internal. The Piano, Campion's breakthrough film, begins with the mute heroine cracking open a shipping crate to reach the instrument that serves as her voice. You're opening the movie with a powerful challenge of trying to protect something which has to create music and can't get wet. How to handle and manage uh, the wild wilderness and something so precious. Holly Hunter's character, Ada, arrives from Scotland for an arranged marriage. When her new husband refuses to transport her piano, Campion shows the instrument, like Ada, alone and out of place in a harsh landscape. That shot sums up everything of their new world and their new life of just an impossible task, set against the most incredible sense of visual beauty, which is quite epic. My experience of working with Jane, I never felt she was more interested in women and portraying female experience than she was in men they're as important to her work as the women are. Harvey Keitel plays Baines, 
a neighbor who buys the piano from Ada's husband so he can sell it back to her one key at a time in exchange for sexual favors. It's that feeling of when something is forbidden, that moment where she has the hole in her tights and he just sort of gently circles it. It's just so much more erotic than actually seeing anything more pornographic than that. I had done a movie with Harvey Keitel when I was 10, so my parents took me to see that movie because we were like, oh, it's the new Harvey Keitel movie. Let's all go see it. So I sat and watched it at like 13 years old in between my mom and my dad. Campion shows Baines from Ada's point of view, reversing the gender bias around nudity in movies. And we were like, oh my God, there's Harvey Keitel's penis. This is so awkward. I want to lie together without clothes on. How many would that be? In that scene, Harvey Keitel's character is quietly strong and, and his power comes through a sort of silence and, and sensitivity. Campion uses Ada's rapid shift from shocked to shrewd. Yes, 10 keys. To indicate the affair's changing power dynamics. She won't live within the boundaries that the culture dictates to her. And when I look at Jane, I see that is in a lot of her work. When Ada's affair is discovered by her husband, played by Sam Neill, Campion presents him as a frustrated voyeur, whose dog licks his palm in an ironic imitation of sexual contact. Sam Neill is the monster, almost, but you feel also his fears and underlying insecurities. Campion underlines the cost of Ada's actions by disrupting Michael Nyman's score with a sudden silence. The music is Ada's creative expression. And it's sort of modern and minimalistic, like Michael Nyman's music is. But it references romantic music, like the music of the period. When the piano premiered at Cannes in 1993, Jane Campion became the first woman to ever win the Palme d'Or. Yes, you want to be proud of her for being a female director, but at the same time, why are we saying that she's a great female director? Why are we just saying that she's a great director? And I think that Jane would kind of get behind that argument as well. What I love about Jane's films is how the women are always complex and there are sort of unknowns um, and mystery, but they're also bold and powerful. The Portrait of a Lady, an adaptation of Henry James's 19th century novel, stars Nicole Kidman as Isabel Archer, an heiress who wants to experience life before marriage. Jane Campion opens her film with portraits of modern women, whose freedom is contrasted with the anguished image of a tearful Isabel preparing to fend off an unwanted marriage proposal. The thing that is in all of Jane's films and in Jane herself is a sort of wish and this need to be yourself. Nicole Kidman's character is tricked into marrying a con artist played by John Malkovich. It's a really dark film. It's a really minute study of a certain kind of toxic relationship. It doesn't look away, the film, it really, really goes there. I think that's what's amazing about, about Jane generally is she really holds her nerve. Though it's Campion's first project with major stars, The Portrait of a Lady is a huge commercial failure. Jane had this big success with the piano and then made some films that people gave less attention to, but she's never pessimistic. You know, she's a really joyous person, and that always infuses her films, however strange or dark the territory gets. With Holy Smoke, Campion introduced another strong-willed heroine. Ruth, played by Kate Winslet, rebels against her suburban Australian upbringing by finding spiritual enlightenment in India. Jane has made many trips to India, so there's an autobiographical quality to it. It's a woman who's in search of an authentic version of herself. No, thank you. No, mate. Thank you. It's fine. Thank you. 
to depict Ruth's transcendental encounter with an Indian guru. Campion abandons naturalism in favor of a hallucinogenic take on Hindu imagery. This magical realism, it, you know, it breaks the reality and it gets so trippy and, and weird. Worried she's joined a cult, her family hires a deprogrammer to stage an intervention. Harvey Keitel in Holy Smoke, he's this really confident, sure of himself, intelligent kind of person who knows exactly what he's doing. Isolated in the Australian outback, Keitel's PJ tries to break Ruth's new faith. That whole movie is about exploring this sort of weird culty kind of place and trying to get Kate's character out of it. And then it turns out that Harvey Keitel's character is actually the one who falls into the well. Marry me. Be my no. bride. By the end, he's in like a red cocktail dress. And it's that kind of reversal that I think is so genius about that movie. No, man, let me go! <laughs> Harvey Keitel, the most masculine, spermy, tough guy, Jane puts him in, in drag. <gasps> Even our own identities dissolve in the face of love. She writes these brutal men that are really easy to judge but gives them this incredible vulnerability. Her villains often end up having a really weak or sometimes pathetic, embarrassing side. She's really willing to put her characters through the ringer. And for an actor, that's really, really fun. <laughs> I had had a brain tumor and I was out of work for a long time. And I get a call that Jane Campion wants to see me for this movie in the cut. I was like 30 pounds overweight. The left side of my face had been paralyzed, so I could barely close my eye at that point. It was like, she'll never cast me. And so I, I, I had that kind of, you know, you, Hollywood, you, you know. We sat down and we started talking about the part, and instantly we were going in two different directions. Because I was so raw, I really asserted myself, and I really said what I thought, thought it should be, and I could see that enlivened her. And to have her just hold me like, and really create an open space and not be threatened by it and totally meet me there, I was like, this is, I'll do anything for her. There is a real fascination in all of Jane's work with love. In a film like In the Cut, it's, people with a, an idea, a notion of what romance is, a hunger for romance and for love and connection. But it's functioning in a very different universe altogether. In the Cut is Jane Campion's erotic thriller starring Mark Ruffalo as a detective investigating a serial killer in New York and Meg Ryan as a witness. Women are being murdered. It's your basic genre serial killer movie, but it's Jane Campion's take on it. A severed arm with an engagement ring shows the true subject of Campion's thriller. It's, a, it's an elaborate film for a genre film. Meg Ryan's character begins to suspect that Ruffalo's detective is the serial killer. It was Meg Ryan, America's sweetheart, playing a total sexually liberated woman. Was it his right arm? When the detective questions the witness about a mugging. To his left. Campion creates tension by blurring the line between a violent act and a seduction. Just remembering that feeling of unease. This is so dangerous, you are walking such a beautifully fine line here. Jane shows it to us how we see it. You know, we're not looking through a male perspective. She's actually making me feel like I am in this scene. It's kind of like a fever dream a little bit. It's like Last Tango in Paris meets like Seven. With the imagery on the subway, the metaphor is like when you give your life to a man in marriage, you're offering yourself up to the killer. Pretty hardcore radical feminism buried inside this genre movie. And that didn't fly. It was a violent, reaction to that movie. The first time I met her was just after she did In the Cut. She'd just come off the press tour and was like, okay, enough. <laughs> 
And I remember seeing some of the reviews afterwards and I thought a lot of the shock and disdain was for the fact that it was made by a woman, not because of the film itself, I feel. After a four-year break from filmmaking, Jane Campion made Bright Star, a period drama about the relationship between romantic poet John Keats and Fanny Braun, who inspired his best work. She wanted to make a film about Keats and about the things he managed to express about life, and her way into that was through this character of Fanny. Strong-willed, passionate, rebellious. In a heated writing room exchange, Campion challenges history's dismissal of Fanny as a toying flirt by presenting the dressmaker as a strong-willed woman pushing against her limited freedom. Men's room, out. Poet's got to do a bit of writing. My stitching has more merit and admirers than your two scribblings put together. <laughs> Goodbye, minstress. And I can make money from it. She said this lovely thing about how people are like poems. You know, and, to, and she was hoping that she could foster in us all a sort of appreciation of poetry, but also life as poetry. I remember going with Jane to the Botanical Gardens in Sydney and looking at the flowers and going to the art gallery and talking about, you know, art. And it's hard to say how that sort of influenced the music, but it kind of does. I've got some feather light violin motif over the top. That's an example of when the music feeds into the scene in a really, I think, is a really nice way. After Keats and Fanny share their first kiss, Campion crafts a series of evocative images that use light, color, and nature to visualize how it feels to be falling in love. She's lying on the bed, and the curtains are just sort of floating, and I just remember being like, Jesus Christ, this was so beautiful. There's a corresponding moment with Keats when he goes up to the top of a tree and lies down amongst the blossoms and he's just sort of luxuriating in these feelings that are going through him. It's a really rare film because I think it really does capture what it feels like to be in that incredible stage of falling in love with somebody. Love and inspiration and creativity like hang out on the same frequency or something. And I feel like you can kind of tune into it and they will sing in some kind of harmony together. <laughs> uh, um, oh my God. Making movies, there are often um, constrictions in, in how creative you can be. And with television, she felt like those restrictions weren't there in the same way. Doing Top of the Lake was completely creatively free. My first day in New Zealand with her, I met her at her house. We did some yoga. Uh, we took this massive hike. And I was sort of like, this is so weird. I'm like walking with Jane Campion through New Zealand. There was something about that process and doing that that was so great. It just made us a team from the very beginning. I said to her, I'm not here to just do what I always do. I want you to push me and I want you to challenge me. And she said, absolutely, but you need to challenge me too. In Jane Campion's TV series, Top of the Lake, Elizabeth Moss plays a detective who returns to her hometown to investigate the rape and disappearance of a pregnant 12-year-old. One thing we thought would be really helpful with the music is to find a theme for Tui, the girl that disappears. And it was our idea to have that theme be a kind of dark lullaby. She has me going into the water and trying to sort of experience what Tui experienced. There's a lot of water imagery in her work, especially in Top of the Lake, and it's beautiful, but it, there's also a cruelty and a coldness that's frightening. You realize how big that landscape is and how impossible it would be to find her. Top of the Lake is, without being preachy, a kind of complicated, sensitive, exploration of rape culture. Robin is a very, very damaged person, which is like a lot of Jane's characters. A very traumatizing event happen as a teenager. Time for a walk, sunshine. <laughs> Shot from a distance, Campion's flashback to the rape of the teenaged Robin conveys her terror more through sound than images. Jane did it in these really tiny little flashbacks that are far more horrifying by not actually showing anything. 
I remember when we were shooting the screaming and the vocal for the rape flashbacks. Jane was out on the floor with me. I had, you know, the headphones on, we had the mic, and she was literally just like holding on to me and pulling me in different directions. Almost did it with me, the these horrific screams. I've never seen a director like get up from the couch and go and actually do the ADR with you. After confronting one of the men who raped her years earlier, Moss goes to visit the guru, played by Holly Hunter, who leads a community of damaged women. We are living out here at the end of the road in a place called Paradise. How's it going, perfect? No. Rejecting the cliche of the wise matriarch. When's the next flight to Reykjavik? G.J. embodies the impatience Campion feels with her own search for peace and self-understanding. Just get away from these crazy The women's camp and G.J. represent Jane so much. Jane's probably the most enabling director I've ever worked with. She's given me stuff for life and for work that are just so valuable. She's, she can be brutally honest. She is not afraid of anyone or anything and will push, push, push you beyond your limits and comfort zone. She has no worry about people being comfortable. Yeah, she's in a total original. You just feel that this is what she's going to be doing and this is how she's doing it. To tell the story and do everything on her terms is earned. You don't get that, you have to earn it. She's the kind of person that would, if you fell on hard times and you needed somewhere to live, she would like let you come and live in her house for a year, if that's what you needed. And that doesn't mean that she's the kindest or the most sort of, you know, she's a normal person. She's not some sort of saint. Um, but if she finds somebody that she also sort of respects and believes is being truthful, she will be there for you till the end of your days.